Hey everyone, it's Christopher Swan, and welcome to this week's episode of Living Your Journey. Each week, I get the amazing opportunity to chat with people that love what they do in life. They understand their passions. Maybe it's a career path or the social impact that they're making. It's kind of like they're following their North Star. Even though their story may change, they understand that they're on their journey every day. This week, I chat with Carlton Russell. He's been working in Hollywood for over 20 years, but our story starts much earlier. Carlton shares memories of growing up in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1960s. He describes memorable moments in life from teenage years through his professional roles in social impact organizations like the Billy Barty Foundation, through his most recent years as a Hollywood actor and stunt double. Carlton shares candidly about his experiences, how they affected his future and outlook on life, and the special people that shared valuable wisdom that kept him focused. Not only is Carlton a terrific guy and guest, he's been a friend of mine for many years. I've been lucky enough to witness his compassion and authenticity for everyone he meets. I'm so happy to give you a glimpse into Carlton's world and connect him with all of you. Oh, and one last thing. You might hear Carlton's dogs in the background a couple of times. Sorry about that. I guess they were eager to chat too. Okay, let's jump into our conversation. So I just started to think like, you have to be on the show. Like, this is a no brainer to me. I was serious. I was like, wait, what? Like he's right in front of me. And I have known you for so long. I was like, this is ridiculous. So yeah, we've known each other forever. Right. So, you know, welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. Well, thank you so much for having me. So you are best known for your acting and stunt double work. I think, you know, if you were to Google you. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we could easily jump right into all of that. And we're definitely going to unpack some of that because, you know, I love Jumpin' Man. And yes, yes. <laughs> clearly you've done so many other good things. But, you know, that's just like close to my heart. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about it, your younger years and those experiences. OK. Yeah. Like I, like I told you earlier, you know, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama during the 60s. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it was fun and games until <laughs> all of the trouble started with the civil rights movement. Um, I was the oldest of um, seven kids. And um, at age five, they noticed that I wasn't growing as fast as the other kids were. As a matter of fact, even though I was the oldest, I was the shortest. Um, and it turned out um, that I had a condition of the pituitary gland that uh, is called panhypopituitary dwarfism. And basically what it did is because the pituitary malfunction, it ceased um, all of the other functions uh, of the pituitary, including thyroid, mm -hmm. um, including um, cortisone production, which is what your body puts out when you're stressed or you're in a situation where you need more adrenaline. Uh, my body doesn't produce any of that. And in addition, what the, the really weird side note to that was, I didn't age as well. Mm -hmm. So here I was, um, I went until I was 28 years old, um, looking pretty much like I was an 11 year old kid. I was, a, I was a man stuck in a child's body, um, so to speak. Yeah. And it's a very rare condition. Um, not so rare now that I've been able to research and learn more about it, but as a child, um, I didn't know anybody or had never even heard of anybody else with the condition. So I, I, I thought I was a mutant on a planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would imagine too, especially as a child and, you know, in the, you know, in that era too, like we didn't, yeah. we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the opportunity to look things up. So yeah, of course. It's like we didn't have the X-Men either, so we didn't know Mutant would be cool. So, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. With even thinking about that, just I, I'm, I love that you laid all that out, too. Talk a little bit about, too, like, you know, I think about a couple things. Alabama in the 60s. I know you went to high school there, too, in the late, late 60s. And I, yeah. I, I mean, that first for me brings up, uh, yeah, like a vision of what that might be like. But then just sharing, like, you know, with you know, with your background and also, you know, not aging like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Like, 
was life, what was life like for you then, you know, in, in Alabama then with, you know, adding that and then just the era of the sixties, I mean, was it still a great childhood or, or it were was, you seeing yeah. life differently? I, I had a great childhood because, um, uh, my, uh, parents and grandparents, uh, did not allow anybody to pity me or do anything for me. Uh, if I needed some done, I had to figure out how to do it. And then if I couldn't accomplish it, then they were allowed to help me. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, if I needed a glass out of the cabinet, um, I had to climb up there and get it and figure out a way to get back down without breaking the glass or my <laughs> butt. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I come from a very poor family. Uh, my grandfather worked in the coal mines for wow. 30, 35 years. And um, it was a very loving family. Uh, because it was the 60s, we didn't we had just gotten access to health care through the university uh, hospital, which is connected to the University of Alabama. Mm. So and this is when I was 12 years old. Uh, uh, the year before, they said it's OK to let black people come to the hospital now. So wow. they took me. In. Yeah. So they took me into the hospital to try to get some kind of diagnosis, you know, what's what's going on, was it a brain tumor, what. Um, so I went to the hospital, and after two weeks of being in the hospital, they came back with the diagnosis, and they also came back with a recommendation for my grandmother, and that was to operate on my brain. And <laughs> I, You can't see my face right now, but <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, my grandmother, un uneducated woman, but wise beyond her years as far as street smarts. She said, well, you know, what, what's that going to do for him? And they said, um, nothing much. We just want to look around. <laughs> <laughs> exploratory so, in your brain. So, yeah, exploratory surgery on my brain, just so they could figure out why, or take a look at, you know, pituitary gland and see why it wasn't functioning. So, of course, my grandmother told him to go to hell and, and not so such nice words as that. Yeah. And, uh, so from 12 to 28, I just continued life, you know, as as expected, despite looking like I was 10 or 11 years old. Um, I graduated from high school in 1969 and went to college. I got a full scholarship to college. Um, which is what my grandmother's concern was. She didn't want, you know, I, I had all of these things going against me. The last thing she needed was something to affect my intellectual development. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so um, thank God for her, um, you know, or I'd be selling oranges on the corner somewhere. Uh, <laughs> she was, like I said earlier, she was wise beyond her years as far as street smarts. Yeah. Um, so I was very active socially. Um, I worked for nonprofit agencies from the time I was 14 years old. Uh, when I became 18, I started working for them and training the college graduates who were just coming out of school, training them how to how to deal with uh, lower income kids. Were you then working for nonprofits even before you went into college, or was yeah, that absolutely. okay? Yeah. yeah. It started with the uh, summer school uh, work program yeah. that the government had for a long time, and that was a program to keep uh, youth busy during the summer mm -hmm. uh, so they wouldn't wind up in trouble because, I mean, we had no access to uh, park facilities or anything like that. Um, the local park didn't allow blacks to swim uh, with the white kids. So the other option for learning how to swim was – going into the woods and somebody tossing you into a, a pond or yeah. wow. or something like that. So I always had an appointment or something to do when that came around for me. So <laughs> I never got Car tossed Carlton. in. <laughs> so there was, oh, you know what? There's a meeting going on. I got to go. I got to go. No throwing for me. Yeah, um, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's, so, I, that's, I mean, that's, I can't even really fathom that kind of like, experience yeah <laughs> well, well, well let me ask you this you know because I, I know you went to college obviously and you but yeah. you were in a couple different you know look I, I think about not just the colleges but you went to college in Texas and in Illinois correct which um you know did college life start to change like your 
perspective on life and different just because you were in a different location and you were being exposed to different experiences? Yeah, well, <clears throat> actually, I had a um, uh, what Oprah calls an aha moment uh, yeah. that happened to me uh, my eighth grade in um, elementary school. Um, I was pretty much, I mean, as you can imagine, uh, I was too small to play organized sports with the other kids. Uh, the teachers wouldn't allow me because they didn't want me to get hurt. So um, one of my favorite teachers was a lady by the name of Mrs. McElwain. And she was a tough bird, man. She was about five foot one and tough as nails. <laughs> I mean, she would take on the toughest bully with, with no problem. So I was passing her class one day, and she grabbed me by my ear and pulled me into her empty classroom. And uh, she gave me a, a, a lecture that I remember vividly to this day. And basically it was, look, uh, these are the cards you were dealt. Now you can either mope about it or you can get on with it. You got a smart, you know, um, brain. You can, you can process things. So get involved. Use, what, use the gifts that God gave you. Mm. And at the time, it didn't impact me. Until we came back to school in September, and I found out that Mrs. McElwain had died over the summer. Mm. And it was like, what? The, the woman was strong as an ox. Well, she had leukemia. And so when I put that advice into the time spectrum, it was a goodbye message to me. But it was also a message like, you know, you can do anything you want to. You know, yeah. not, nothing's going to stop you if you put your mind to it. And from that moment on, I became involved in um, student government, I, class president, all of that. And pretty much by the time I got, a, got to college, uh, a lot of the local kids had gone to that college because they were not giving out scholarships or whatnot. I knew practically everybody on campus. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> so here, here comes this little, looks like an 11-year-old kid who's signing freshmen's books and making them run errands and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, so I just fit right in. Um, well, that's, it, I love that. And I love that you, because you were young still, I mean, to get that yes. kind of advice when I think yes. about that too, you know, because you, like you hadn't even started your r real adult, you know, no. career or that sort of life. So that's a, it's a great opportunity at that point to, to get it. I'm kind of curious about like, um, where, what part of your journey was happening after college? Well, um, much to my dismay, um, I graduated from college, uh, with, uh, outstanding senior, outstanding black senior, who's who among students, American colleges and universities, all of the accolades. Yeah. And I was chairman of the majority of organizations on campus, including the one that funded student government. Uh, I was the chairman of that one. So I expected my life to roll on just like that. Mm. But when I got out into the real world, nobody wanted to hire a social worker who looked like he was 11 years old. Mm. And so it went from one job interview to another job interview to another job interview uh, with uh, <laughs> one person even asking me, um, you bring your parents? Um, what's going on? You know, he's looking around the room like candid camera cameras or secretly hidden in his room or something. So <laughs> wow. uh, it, it was really hard. So um, I went back to Alabama, which, believe me, was not uh, something that was in my, my plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was out of money. I was out of places to stay. And um, I at that same time, the Department of Vocational Rehab Rehabilitation came into existence. They came into existence in 1975, and I graduated from college in 1976. So I heard that they had a job um, program where they would assist people with disabilities to uh, get jobs. So part of that process was sending me to one of their specialists to verify that I had a disability. Hmm. Um, so in that happening, the endocrinologist that I saw after going over my charts and looking at my bone density scans, which is where your, your growth plates are located in your wrist. Mm, okay. And as long as those are open, you can continue to grow. But once they close, you're done growing. So they did an x-ray and come to find out I had the bone age of an 11-year-old. My growth plates were still wide open as if 
at any other 11 year old. Um, so he suggested that I may grow two to three inches if I took growth hormone injections. Now, let me just jump back a little bit. Just one caveat that I didn't mention. They had mentioned that when I was 12 years old and uh, they see if we give him hormone injections, he'll be able to grow five foot five, five foot seven, whatever, you know, the family height is. Mm. And, uh, you know, my parents or grandparents were all excited and it's okay. Well, you know, what's this going to cost? And they said, well, right now it's about $850 a month. Now, mind you, this is 1963. Mm -hmm. A brand new car cost three thousand dollars then. Wow! Yeah. So, uh, with a with a poor family, uh, no access to health care, and now you're saying eight hundred eight hundred fifty dollars a month, and I can get this magical potion. So, needless to say, I never got it, and I went on with my life. So now, fast forward. I'm a 28-year-old unemployed college graduate, and I was jumping at anything I could. Um, and I said, you know, if it makes me grow three inches in a, um, in a year, I'll take it. Yeah. And so I started with the injections, which, of course, was paid for by the Department of Rehab. Um, and I grew three inches the first month, which, you know, dumbfounded the doctors. They had never seen it, uh, never even really expected it to work that well. Um, yeah, so, and that sounds extreme too. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people said, well, you know, did it hurt? Did you get any, any side effects? And uh, no side effects. It was as if my body kicked in, only it kicked in like 15 years later than it was supposed to <laughs> Just delayed reaction. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so within a year and a half of being on those, um, injections, I grew 12 inches. So I went from three foot ten, forty two pounds at age twenty eight to four foot ten, ninety two pounds at age thirty. Wow. Yeah. So that the the increase in height helped, but I still look like an eleven year old. Yeah. Only, uh, only taller. So um desperation kicked in, uh couldn't find work and uh had no luck with the department on the rehab program other than the medical aspects. So a friend called and said, hey, they're having auditions with the circus. And, you know, I was totally vehemently opposed to that. Wait, Carlton, you know, Carlton, let me just pause you there for a minute because yeah, okay, you, okay. you cut out for just a minute and I want you to actually repeat that line because I think I heard it, but I want people to hear what that is. So um, who was in town? The circus, Ringling Brothers Circus was in town. Okay, I, that's why I want you to repeat because I think that's important because it's almost like, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. you're almost like pulling her leg, but I remember this, yeah, yeah. And it, you know, I had this, I had this real hatred for the circus and what it, or what I thought it meant uh, for people with who are different, you know, ex, um, exploitation, the yeah. whole thing. So the last thing I wanted to do was run off and join the circus. And, uh, but I was desperate. Um, so I did that. I, I auditioned for clown college. They gave me a, um, scholarship, which they had never done before. And, um, I went to clown college, uh, for 11 weeks. And during that time I became friends with the, uh, uh, one of the, back then they called them personnel directors. Now it's human resources. Sure. And, um, um, she liked me and liked my story and she knew all the, my skill sets and uh, that I had a college degree and all of that. And so she offered me a job in Washington, D.C. in the advertising department. And I went there uh, and within nine months, I was offered the uh, role of administrator mm -hmm. of the clown college. Um, and computers were just becoming popular at that time. And uh, in D.C., they had a bunch of extra ones because they just bought them wholesale and just put them in any, em any empty desk. <laughs> the computer. No, that almost speaks um, <laughs> loudly yeah. of um, Washington, D.C. Oh, why don't we just spend extra money, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I found a, a computer that hadn't been assigned to anybody, and I learned uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3, which is an accounting system. Gosh, software. yes, I remember this. Yeah. And I taught myself computers and, you know, it was like, it was a love affair. Yeah. Know? And, um, well, the thing, 
the thing with Ringling Brothers is like I like like I said earlier, you know, it was something that I despised, but it turned out to be the one people that had no preconceived ideas or conceptions about me. Yeah, it was like we hired a guy, do the job, that's it. You know, there was no nothing involved with my size. It was like the guy's smart. You know, he has a lot of skills. Let's put him to work. And were they respectful while you were there? Very extremely respectful so i'm the only little person to have been an executive at uh ringling brothers so and it's so interesting too because i mean it's almost like i think in this day and age if we were to talk about like the circus and things like that it does like you know i i think really come on now yeah yeah next connotations of the yin yang right but i think there's real there's there's truth and reality to that story and what it was like also because it's not it's 2016 now and it was not like that back then. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, so I love, I mean, it's, I almost want to write it down like, you know, circus, clown college. I mean, that's kind of awesome. I, I, <laughs> um, but I, you know, and I, I, I'd love to jump forward for just a little bit too. And, sure, and sure. um, and that's one of the things I, I like to do a lot too is, um, I want to get over to a little bit too, because I, I know this and I know before acting, you know, you worked for the Short Stature Foundation and Billy right. Barton Foundation. And of course, I know that you're very active with the Little People of America organization. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, what was your first connection to these sorts of organizations? Um, my first connection was upon moving to uh, California. I actually, I met a lady. I, I attended my first uh, Little People convention. They, they hold these conventions in different cities uh, throughout the year, throughout the states, yeah. and uh, this particular year it was in uh, 1986 in Dearborn, Michigan, and I went. I didn't know a soul, didn't know anybody, and I went there, and I met this teeny tiny lady in a wheelchair, and she was the most gregarious, loud, <laughs> fun person I'd, I'd ever met, and she just did not see barriers to anything. And I kind of adopted her attitude. You know, I was like, you know what? (laughs) Hell with it. You know, let's just do what we're doing. And I met her and she said, if you're ever in California, look me up. She gave me her info. And uh, two years later, I'm in California and I decided to call her. And the guy answered the phone and I said, yeah, I'm looking for Gracie. Um, he said, well, she's in Australia right now. And I'm like, whoa, Australia? <laughs> you know, I had never been outside of the United States at that time. And, you know, uh, I just, this teeny tiny woman is now in Australia. So when she, um, she told the guy who was at the office that this is the guy I had been telling you about that I met in Dearborn. He has a degree in social services. He's, you know, he's management experience. You got to hire him. So they gave me a job. Mm-hmm. And um, that's where I met my wife because she was a, um, a volunteer. She did volunteer work on the weekends. Uh, one of our major fundraisers was a, uh, a bingo game for senior citizens. And um, when I started working there, she was accompanying Gracie to Australia. And everybody kept saying, wow, you just wait until you meet Jody, wait until you meet Jody. <laughs> So she's a she's a firecracker, man. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Let's. I can't take two of them in my life. <laughs> One, one's enough. So um, she was in Australia with Gracie, and two weeks later they came back, and I was doing my stick with the senior citizens, collecting money, you know, cashing tickets, and I went up to cash a ticket, and I saw this gorgeous green-eyed lady, and my, you know, like the Italians say, you know, I was. Thunderstruck, dumbstruck, whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it. And it's just, I, I, I could barely talk. <laughs> and um, introduced myself and asked her out. And 26 years later, we're still together. Ah, absolutely. Well, yeah. of course. And that's how I met you, was through yeah, her. Yeah, that's how we met. Yeah. Well, you know, with um, even just when you're meeting, when you met Gracie and, mm-hmm. you know, it was, and then obviously working um, for Short Stature Foundation. You know, then you had a career, you know, for a while with the Billy, uh, Billy Barty Foundation. And then, you know, there's um, LPA, the Little People of America. I- I'm curious about that, too, because you talked about you- you've been to some of the like conventions or-, or pieces like that. 
it sounds like your journey at this point too is really, you know, you're really involved with things, but also there were some tough moments and how can you like keep growing your career with working with these kind of organizations? Was this still like, I'm working my career, my social service, or did this become something else? Because it was also related to things that were personal for you. It, yeah, it, it really became a, a personal thing. When I moved to California, I moved to California with the extent, express purpose of becoming a working actor. Mm. Um, oh, so you actually were coming to be an actor, but not yes. to actually like work in these foundations right. specifically. Right, no, no. Oh. It's, it's something that kind of... Um, you know, fortune had it that it just, you know, fell into my lap. Um, so can I, get, well, let me pause my question then and ask this because just to make sure I'm on the right path. So, mm-hmm. cause you were acting, like you said, since you were five, right. Yes. And, you know, we're doing these things in church. So it's since then, and even in like college and whatnot, did you want, was that your dream and your passion? Like I, I need to go act no, because no. I, I put it in the back burner, like I said. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody who I had, I had told that I wanted to be an actor had said pretty much the same thing. You better get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I you think better, they probably say that still. Yeah, yeah. you better get a job, something that's going to pay the bills. And, uh, you know, a lot of kids who come from my you know similar background, uh, very few options and... When people see that you have a little something extra, they think that they're helping you because, you know, they're steering you in the right direction. But what they were really doing was postponing my destiny. Oh. But I felt what was my destiny. And it, it, it took just a few more years of me growing up and, and being exposed to the world to really be prepared and ready for when that opportunity opportunity came. So I am grateful that for that because uh, when I came out here, like I said, my intention was to go straight into acting. And had I done that, I would have missed out on so many adventures that I've been on since then. I love that you said that, Carlton. I, um, I've i talked about this with other guests in the background, you know, or in, in, in the past that yeah, it's like, you know, the path that you're on, if you would have done it sooner, you would have missed other things or you wouldn't have evolved and had the skills that you needed to or the experiences where you like you wouldn't have met, you know, your wife, Jody. And right. so, well, I'm, I am really curious then maybe I, I know I'd love to because I might take a step back, but I want to jump forward a little bit then, too. And since we're on the topic of the of the acting. So, OK, so you came to California, you did all these other things. But tell me about jumping over that, like like what was your start into actually acting and doing like the, the stunt doubles and that kind of stuff? Yeah. Well, um, my grandfather had a saying, you know, if, uh, never look down on anybody, you know, um, uh, if you, whatever you do in life, just be the best at it. And that means if you're cleaning garbage in the streets, be the best street sweeper there is. Yeah. And so I've always incorporated that mindset. So, while I was with the Billy Barty Foundation and the Short Stature Foundation, I was studying acting at night. Um, because a lot of people don't understand is that it's an entirely different animal when you have cameras involved and sound technicians and all of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, you have to learn, in addition to the acting, you got to learn how to move around on, on set, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Sure. So, so I started... Um, I, like, I spent three years studying acting uh, with an with a acting coach, and I came in office one day, and I said, now's the time. And I submitted my resignation, and I started working as a stand-in, which is kind of like an understudy yeah. on, on Broadway, uh, except you never get to go on. <laughs> <laughs> but it was better than acting school because I got to go toe-to-toe with these famous actors on a daily basis yeah. acting, you know, and, and, and having them go, dude, you got, you, you got the chops, you know, you got, you're the real deal, you know, and to have a Robert Townsend or a Sinbad telling me, you know, on a daily basis, man, and you need to keep it up. Wow. So that kind of, uh, motivated. Yeah, absolutely. What was the, what was the turning point? Like when you walked into, um, submit your res, uh, resignation, like, what was it that said, hey, I'm ready, let's do this thing? Like, like wh- uh, why not wait anymore? You know, I, I call it, you know, I'm, I'm very spiritual. I'm not very religious. 
but I think it was a, a, a divine moment for me. It was just a inner knowing mm. that okay, you you prepared. Yeah. You know, you, okay. You're you prepared, and now is the time. I, it, you know, there wasn't an audit, auditory voice or anything like that. It was just a knowing deep inside of me. It was like you're ready. You can do this. You know, put your fears aside. And besides, if if it doesn't work out, you can sell shoes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I, I love I love that I because I, I know you're being funny about it a little yeah, bit yeah. too. But there's isn't there truth in that? Like that helps you because so many people are afraid of taking that next step yes. of what will happen. Yeah, but the, gonna I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. I when I came out here, I came out here with a friend of mine. And, you know, with the same same intention, he was going to come out and become an actor and all of that. Um, he stayed here for three months and he I literally watched him shaking his boots. He was so afraid of stepping out and claiming what I say, claim what is yours. Mm. You know, it's there. It's it's got your name on it. All you got to do is claim it. And he I just watched him just fall deeper and deeper into despair. And it was nothing that was holding him back except himself. Hmm. So at the end of three months, he wound up going back to Alabama. And I haven't heard from him since, and that was 26 years ago. And um, I just learned to just grab onto anything that, you know, if it's something I want to do. I was made fun of in, uh, in the 12th grade uh, teacher had one of those questions. Uh, what do you want to do in life? You know, when you grow up. And I said, Well, I'm not about doing anything, but I want to go to Africa. And the entire class just erupted into laughter. And you know, I'm I'm ready to start hurling insults around the room. But you know, I would say, Oh, okay, watch. And yeah. sure enough, um, my senior year, the um, chairman of the black history department came to me and he said, Hey, I understand that you have a uh, bookkeeping skills. I said, yeah, well, I went to a technical high school. So I studied bookkeeping for two years. He said, well, I need somebody to keep books uh, on my annual trip to Africa and I'll pay all of your expenses. <laughs> Boom. Isn't, yeah, it, isn't it funny how these things can happen? That was my moment. Yeah. And I, and I grabbed it and I was the best bookkeeper he ever had. Because I think that I was not going to do anything to jeopardize yeah. going there. And it goes right back to what your grandfather told you, right? Yeah. If you're going to do Absolutely. something, do it the best. Just do be really good best. at it. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. thinking about back to your, you know, the friend that you had mentioned about, you know, like was in Hollywood and was shaking his boots. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I know enough of Hollywood and worked with enough people in that space that I know it's a super tough industry for yes. anyone. Yes. You know, and just thinking about you know, you Carlton. And so you've got this, you know, shorter stature, you're a little person, you're, it's also, uh, I don't know, I was gonna say, well, oh, it's not 2016, but I don't know if that really matters. But you're black in this industry as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, did, had, did you experience challenges that were, like, you know, I mean, I would assume, but I don't, you know, I'm just curious, like, what kind of experiences or challenges did you face in Hollywood? And, and what, what made you like move past them? Um, yeah, uh, there were there were definitely challenges. Um, I did not want to become um, one of those. Oh, look at him! He's cute and short. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I wanted to be a real actor, so I studied the Meisner technique for three years, um, and I wanted to be an actor. And so every audition I went on, I would you know take my best game and I kill it and one day a director said to me wow you're really good man I just wish you were taller and I'm like well if I'm good what does it matter how tall I am you know and uh, I had those kind of things all the time I would go to uh, open calls where they really don't have an idea of what they're looking for what size mm -hmm. it could be black white short tall they don't know uh, but as soon as I walked in the door, you know, it was like, no, no, not you, not you, that kind of thing. Yeah. So here I am. I've been, I've run a million dollar, uh, or, you know, operation down at Ringling Brothers. I run two uh, nonprofit agencies. 
uh, but I can't get hired to portray an executive director in Hollywood. And that's the conundrum, you know. Um, I know a lot of, I know a lot of little people, actors who've been in the business for 30 years and most have not had speaking parts. It's always been costumes or, mm. um, you know, work like that. And I, that's not what I wanted. I mean, the money was great, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. Sure. How did you get past some of that stuff? Because I know that you, you've you had this long career of having different roles. And, uh, and I know, obviously, you have this whole kind of side of this stunt double piece as well. Mm-hmm. So how did you, like, was it, and I don't mean physically, but was there something that you just said, yeah, but that's not what I want to do, and that kept you motivated to keep trying and push through to have success? Yeah. I, I had learned early on that... Um, Harrison Ford, who's uh, one of those actors I, I look up to, worked as a carpenter mm-hmm. for many years in Hollywood. That's right. And in an interview, he said, the reason I worked as a carpenter is so I could turn down shitty jobs. <laughs> and so that's so how smart. I, that's how I became a stunt double. <laughs> so I was making the same money and I could turn down shitty auditions. You know, I remember the first time I went on a, 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 a little people audition, quote unquote, I walked into the room and everybody there is in a costume and, you know, with elf shoes and all of that crap on. And I'm like, this ain't what I signed up for, <laughs> you know. So I turned around and walked. Yeah. And, you know, it's you have to be truthful to your path and not live somebody else's, you know. And, and, and I have no problems with people who have to do that. Maybe they don't have the education I have. Maybe uh, they have children that need shoes. I don't know. And that's, that's you know, I have no problem with that. But for me, that was not the path yeah. that, that I had chosen for myself or, or that I accepted to walk. What would you, I love that. And I, I love that you think about it that way too. Well, you know, just the, even thinking about somebody starting today, if there was somebody, you know, some actor friends that you're like, and I think there's challenges for no matter who you are. So if there is like someone that needed some advice, you know, just starting out in, you know, Hollywood or any kind of career that's coming up with some sort of roadblock or challenge, what kind of thing would you tell them as advice? Well, <clears throat> the, the first thing I would tell them is learn your craft, be the best, be the best at it so that when that opportunity arises, uh, you're prepared for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't have to run out and get a coach. You don't have to run out and, you know, try to learn this or try to learn that. You already know it. Um, I had an audition uh, in Living Color with Tony Cox, who's a very famous little person, uh, African-American little person, actor. And um, he and I auditioned for In Living Color, and we got the part. He and I did. And um, I found... <laughs> He's going to kill me for saying this, but <laughs> he was afraid of performing in front of a live audience. Mm. And here's a guy who's done 60 movies, you know, from when I was a puppy. I mean, he's going to kill me for that, too, because he's not as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> but here's, you know, he's he's got all of this experience and he's afraid to act in front of a live in, in front of a live audience. Yeah. And. For a stage actor like myself, that's what you want. You know, that's like, you know, bring it on, you know. And so I learned that you just got to be prepared because what they did was he had all of the major lines, but because of his stage fright, he couldn't perform it. So they gave the lines to me. And I was prepared. Yeah. I was prepared for it. Now, had I not been, had I been some Joe Blow who had just stepped off the bus and say, hey, I'm an actor and that's it. I would not have had the skills to to pull that off. But because I had spent three years studying, I was, you know, preparation, you know, was already done and, and opportunity presented itself. Yeah, that's good advice. You know, like you said, learn your craft. So learn when the craft. opportunity is there, you're the best. You're the best at it. Exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, just going on a little bit of lighter side, because we haven't really talked about that, too. Um, just because you have been doing, you know, you've been acting and, and the stunt double work for such a long time. I'm just really curious. Um, what are some of your maybe f- 
memorable moments out of out of these experiences like you know we we've talked about a few of them here and there but i'm just curious too because because like you said you could um not take the jobs you didn't want because you already had you know work that yeah. you were doing so <clears throat> because you've been taking more things that you really enjoyed what are some memorable moments out of those things that you really uh, put yourself into well yeah there's been several um one is with a very famous actor I work with, um, and I was stunt doubling a kid, and it was a uh, a driving scene where this child was in the back seat, and a stunt driver was supposed to come around. And in Hollywood, you know, you can't put kids in any kind of situation where they can be injured, so that's where the role of the stunt double comes in, even though sometimes you're not doing anything but being a passenger. Mm. Uh so I got on set and they said, they moved your, they moved your time up. So we need to get you in hair and makeup like right away. I said, okay, I'll do that. I go, I turn the corner. There's a hair and makeup on the left. There's a wardrobe on the right. So I shoot into the hair and makeup and there's three uh, of these um, heads like they use for wig placements. Sure. And there's, there's three of those and each one has a toupee on it. And the there's only one person in the trailer, which is unusual. Usually there's three or four people working on you. And uh, this guy comes running and he goes, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And I go, um, you know, they told me to come to hair and makeup. He goes, no, 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 no. You have to get out of here. This is blank, blank, blank's trailer. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that was a secret that wasn't supposed to be known by the general population uh, so that was a very interesting um, uh, situation to be in. So anyway, they the ran me out the of that pay, trailer. The toupee <laughs> secret? <laughs> a famous um, balding actor that we don't know about now. <laughs> I love that. I, I love that you find yourself into these like odd situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was one. Uh, I had a, uh, another one. My wife had always says, you know, you, if you're ever in a situation where you're going to get hurt, your stunt career is over. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I was in uh, New Orleans working on a reality show. And uh, there was a situation where uh, a storm had come through, knocked over some trees. And the grandfather is cutting up the trees for firewood. And the trunk of the tree, once he cut most of it off, the weight shifted and the tree stood back up, kind of crushing the kid on the knee. Oh. Who was picking earthworms to go fishing. So I doubled that kid, and they dug a trench for me to fall into. So uh, the director says, on three, fall into the trench. The tree will fall in the end of the shot. Okay, perfect. We shoot. Goes off without a hitch. Perfect. The director goes, okay, this time I want you to go on four. Now, the tree was connected to a backhoe, uh, one of those big tractor things. Sure. So the director wanted me to go on four, but nobody told the uh, tractor operator <laughs> that we were going on four. So he went on three. So <laughs> before I could get into my trench, the tree hit me in the back, oh. uh, landed on top of me as I went into the trench. Uh, so, you know, they had an onset personnel, medical personnel, and they came over and you're going to be sore for a couple of weeks, but nothing's broken, you know, that kind of thing. But now I'm like, how in the hell am I going to hide this from my wife? She's going to kill me. <laughs> uh, so for two weeks, I walked around the house um, pretending, you know, always wearing an undershirt or making sure I had on a long T-shirt or something so she couldn't see the bruise because it was humongous. So uh, two weeks later, I let my guard down and she walked up behind me and just hugged me. You know, hey, babe, how you doing? And she touched the spot. Uh -huh. And I was like a cat on fire. <laughs> I was like hanging from the ceiling because, ow, <laughs> It hurt so bad when she touched it. She goes, pull your shirt up right now. Pull it up. And I lifted it up. And there's this purple and black and oozing mess. Needless to say, that was my last stunt job. <laughs> I love that that was one of your memorable moments you shared yes. with me. <laughs> she said, that's it. You're done. Wow. That's crazy. Well, you know, um, you know, when we talked recently to, you know, because I, 
I, I think that you're you're officially retired from yes, from doing is. these roles. But I know that, you know, when special things come up like um, that, I alluded to this earlier that, um, you know, the Jumpin' Man role that you played in Fire Walk With Me, the mm-hmm. um, the wait, it was the was it the prequel? No, it was a sequel to yeah. um, sequel to um, Twin Peaks. Mm-hmm. And now that, um, you know, David Lynch is re um, bringing the series back that you have another role in that. So yeah. is, is that like a great example of, yeah, you're retired, but when special opportunities come up, because it's still a passion of yours that you find opportunities to, to still be in something? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's also um, um, one of the examples that, I, you know, I kind of live by. If you do good work, people will, will seek you out. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things that he said about me. He's a, Carlton is a total professional, and I would hire him for any movie that I'm working on. So 25 years later, he still remembered me and called me to, to come back. I love that. Mm-hmm. You, I, you know, and knowing through, like, just your participation with... You know, just because you've been really active in, you know, um, Little Person Association uh, or Little People, and, you know, with your acting... It, because you kind of have this, I don't know, split purpose almost like you, you know, you had this wonderful passion of acting and also participating in organizations that are close to you. Now that you are retired and you know, you're still active and doing different things. Mm -hmm. Do you find that, you know, your purpose or things that you're really hoping to accomplish still, like has that evolved for you now? Yeah, actually that's a very good question. Um, Because, uh, with with the acting, it was I never approached acting as I want to be famous. Mm-hmm. I approached it as this is something I'm good at, and it brings joy to me, so I want to do it. Um, so once I retired, um, it kind of came came for kind of not a replacement, but just something. And this is with the healthcare movement. Um, I don't ever want to be in a situation where a kid has to go through what I went through simply because he's poor. Yeah. So that kind of got me involved um, with, with the health care initiative. I was on the um, uh, Los Angeles County Commission for Disabilities for six years. Um, so that's where my passion is. My, that that has always been my passion, mm-hmm. uh, the, the social work aspect of it, the social involvement. Um, it seems it seems almost like you were able to, it's almost like you, you kind of ebbed and flows in different things, things that you really enjoyed, but you were like, oh, yeah. I can have acting time, and then I can mm-hmm. get back to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, I, it, I'm just, and this is why I actually thought it was really important to ask you this too, because I haven't, I haven't talked to anybody on the show yet that's really been... I think in this part of their journey, they're in the middle of starting a new career or they're, they're seasoned in their career, but they're still working hard at it. I, and I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, now that you've, you've done a couple things, you've done a couple of really big things and you've evolved mm-hmm. your career. Like when you look back at life now, or maybe even just saying, hey, I had all these great experiences. And now that knowing what you're doing today, if you were to like tell somebody who is like middle career, like, is there any advice you say about like, you know, what to focus on or or what to pay attention to so you can still have yeah. opportunities outside of what you see? Yeah, yeah. You know, I for me, I, I I see especially young people, I see so many young people who are out their only motivation is money. Sure. And and for some reason having grown up poor, uh it's it's never been something because I was taught to appreciate the things in life that don't cost anything. I, I always try to go that route and I tell people, you know, follow your passion. What is it that makes you happy? That makes you want to get up in the morning and do take the money out of the equation, because if you love doing it, you'll find a way to make the money. Hmm. Well, you like know? you, like you said, like Harrison Ford said, you, right, you get that side job, you get that other job, so you can pick the things you love in your passion. Exactly. Yep, exactly, exactly. But I, I, I do find that a lot of people today are 
kind of getting away from the value-oriented professions, not value in the sense of monetary, but in the sense of how it makes you feel inside as a human being. Mm -hmm. And they're more concerned now with how much is it going to pay, what's the stock options, all of that. I mean, don't get me wrong, all of that's great. But at the end of the night, when you lay your head down, you want to say, I did a good job or I, you know, I at least made a dent in it. I tried. Do you think that's part of evolution for us yeah. in our life as well? Like, absolutely. I think about that when I'm a, a young person. Of course, that's kind of what I see and, and maybe what I see from society. And then yeah. as I get older, I start to see diff- just different meaning and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, you know, life is always giving you other challenges. Um, you know, I'm, I'm learning to code now. Um, like I said, I've, I'm always interested in this stuff. One of my biggest passions is learning. I love learning. Mm-hmm. And I, if, I figure if you, if you never stop learning, your brain is always going and is always thinking of that next thing that you can get involved in uh, that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. I, we had another guest that um, said something very similar about that. It was his passion is about, about learning. It wasn't about just one craft, but it was right. e- even though he harnessed it in certain ways. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as we as we just wrap up here too, I'm just you know, I just think about like starting from Alabama, you know, in the the 50s and 60s, and then working all the way through and thinking about like the circus and all that kind of stuff that you've learned and experienced. And I, you know, we've talked about some of this too, some of the challenges about, you know, your size, the mm-hmm. way that you look and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> do you feel like that, even though that's like, we don't want anybody to really go through things that are prejudice and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But as you reflect, do you feel like that has taught you lessons? Like one thing you talked about was the, you know, be great at your craft, whatever it is. Yeah. But, but do you feel like you've learned other lessons through those experiences as well now that, you know, at this part of life? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the I think the most important thing I've learned, especially growing up in Alabama, I mean, it, it was basically, an, for me, an all-black world mm. until the people in power, like the police officers or the mailman or the insurance salesman, they were all white but everybody else was black. So for me to grow up and in that environment and then to learn about the world and to have traveled to Africa and Australia and all over the Caribbean and Jamaica twice and the Bahamas, I learned that people are people are people are people. Mm. And I've, I've, um, I have a lot of real close LGBT uh, friends, and and my main goal, uh, and that is that I know what it's like living like as a second class citizen, and I don't want anybody to go through that again. And and that's the LGBT uh, community, that's the little people community, that's whatever you know. Yeah, you're right. It's just almost like what you said earlier about like you know yeah, working in like healthcare. To go through that. It's you don't want anybody to feel what it's like, even with like class, class systems, you know, become the same way. So I think that's that's smart because it's really the real lesson out there is no matter who you are, we're all just people. Right. Yeah. And also be the best that you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Carlton, I think this has been a real treat just uh, to kind of talk through a little bit of like your background and, you know, walking through just like I know we didn't take deep dives on everything, but I think it's like enough I think perspectives or colors to understand like it almost uh, I would just think of this as a summary sort of like it's like it doesn't sure we have all have challenges and some have harder ones than others but in the end of the day if you love something you got to go for it and be the oh, best that you can absolutely and absolutely. and also find alternatives like like you said like the stunt double piece or the yeah. whatever like you yeah. find a way yeah thanks for sharing all the lessons and walking through this stuff I just it's been a real treat. The, the last thing I, I would ask, too, that I usually ask our guests is, if people want to follow along with you or just maybe learn a little bit more about your story, is there a place online that you would point people to? Uh, there's not a place online right now, but I am uh, working on a book oh. uh, about my life. I, I love that. So uh, with my wife, 
cracking the wheel. I'll, I'll get that done soon. <laughs> I'm sure Jody will uh, do that. I'll, I'll keep you informed. Yeah, Carlton, as as time goes on, do let us know and we'll let people you know, know what the progress is on that. Um, and then, um, you know, if people do want to ask you some questions or whatnot, we can always funnel that through our website and have a conversation there. Yes. Well, Carlton, this has been a real treat. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank Um, you. I had a blast. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Now, over to you. Any thoughts or questions you'd like to share? Seriously, do you have any questions you'd like to ask me or the guest? We'll answer them and even get the guest to help us. So send us a message, use our Facebook page and email us there, or post a comment or question on the page, or tweet us at accidentalinfo using hashtag livingyourjourney. You can find out more about all the guests, links to their sites and social channels, and even bonus content all at accidentalinformation.com. Now, a couple favors. Go subscribe to the show and you'll be the first to get the download before everyone else. Also, take just a couple moments and head over to the show in iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a quick review. Quick, easy, and I would love it. This totally supports us and it helps me bring in interesting guests each week and keeps the show going. Also, I love to read them and see what you guys are really thinking. Thanks for joining the conversation. And remember, Living Your Journey is available every Tuesday. Until next week.